21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. What do you mean, suspicious men? Where are they? A boat sitting in the car? What kind of a car? Yeah. Yeah. You are, by transcription, in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Okay. I'll send the officers over there to have a look. Now, how are you going to have to worry about that? All right. Yeah. Twenty first precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was 7.25 when I arrived at the station house. I signed the blotter and went into my office where I changed into uniform. Then, since it had been 24 hours since I was last on duty, I sat down at my desk to glance over reports and communications covering that time in order to bring myself up to date on conditions in the precinct before I turned out the 8th before platoon. <clears throat> 21st precinct, Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Rose, I'm P.S., Captain. Yes, Sergeant. Patrolman Dillon is out here. He'd like permission to talk to you. Is he working the 8th before? Yes, sir. All right, tell him to come in. Okay, Captain. Okay, Dillon. Oh, uh, Sergeant. Is Lieutenant King in the house yet? I haven't seen him come in, Captain. All right. Let me know when he does. Yes, sir. Come in. Oh, come in, Dylan. Yes, sir. Morning, Captain. Dylan, what is it? There was an envelope left for me at the station house yesterday, Captain. Yeah, huh? It had a hundred dollars in it. In cash? Yes, sir. Who left it? I don't know, sir. There was no name. Where was it left? At the desk, I suppose, Captain. It was in the mail rack. Were you on the job yesterday? Yes, sir. When did you find it in the rack? When I came off the tour. Exactly what was in the envelope? Five twenty-dollar bills and a short note. What did the note say? Well, it just said, with much gratitude to a fine young public servant. No signature? Nothing. No return address on the envelope? No, sir. How was the envelope addressed? I just had my name and my shield number on it. Was it handwritten or typed? Handwritten, Captain. The note, too? Yes, sir. Where are they? I have them here. All right, let's see them. Yes, sir. Well, pretty good paper. Yes, sir. Nice, nice and heavy. This is uh, just how it came. It was sealed, Captain. Yes, I understand that. You have any idea who brought it in? No, sir. Why didn't you turn it into the desk officer as soon as you received it? Well, Captain, I didn't open up the envelope until I got home. You mean there was a letter in the rack for you and you didn't open it until you got home last night? No, sir, I didn't. You saw what it was and you decided to bring it right in to me this morning? Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad you understand. It's contrary to the rules to accept gratuities. Yes, sir, I, I understand it. Between you and me, Dylan, it's also contrary to the rules to uh, think about it overnight. I didn't open up the envelope until I got home, Captain. I couldn't come back with it last night. Yes, I understand. You haven't any idea where this hundred dollars came from? No, sir. Lieutenant Gorman was on the job as desk officer yesterday during the 8th of fall, wasn't he? Yes, sir. And who had T.S. duty? Sergeant Waters the first four hours and Sergeant Tierney the second four well, which one of the three of them received this envelope? I don't know, Captain. Sit down, Dylan. Listen. Okay. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Rosen. Sergeant. 
Sergeant, is Lieutenant Gorman out at the desk yet? No, sir. He just came in. He's changing. Did you see Sergeant Waters around there? I see Sergeant Waters in the back room. Yes, sir. All right. Go get him and ask him to step into my office. Yes, sir. What about Lieutenant Gorman? You want to see him? I'll let you know after I talk to Sergeant Waters. Yes, sir. You, uh, you have no idea where this money came from, huh, Dylan? No, sir. You mean you've uh, been a fine young public servant on so many occasions that it would be just impossible to recall one particular incident? No, sir. It's just that... Well, it's not that. I, I just have no recollection of anything I did that might lead to this. Well, it appears to be a woman's handwriting. Does that help any? No, oh, sir. I went through every page of my memorandum book back to the last four or five weeks. There wasn't a thing in there nor anything else that I could recall. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, it's pretty good paper, all right. Well, you have stuff. Yes, sir. And brand new 20s. Come in. Sergeant Rose, I said you wanted to see me, Captain. Yes, Sergeant, come in. Yes, sir. Hello, Dylan. Sergeant Waters. What time did you have telephone switchboard duty yesterday, Sergeant? No, to the end of the tour, Captain. Mm-hmm. You recognize this envelope? Oh, yeah. Lieutenant Gorman was busy booking a person and one of the detectives brought down. A woman came in the front door and I asked her if I could help her. She said she wanted to leave a note for Patrolman Dylan. This was it. I took it back and put it in the rack. Did the woman leave her name? No, sir. You didn't recognize her as anyone you know? No, sir. How old a woman was she? Well, late 60s or early 70s, I'd say, Captain. She wasn't young. Does that make it easier for you, Dylan? No, sir. What'd she look like, Sergeant? Well, she was pretty well dressed. She had on a fur coat. I imagine she was 5'3 or 5'4. Rather on a thin side. Gray hair and she wore glasses. There was a little bit of class about it. What'd she say to you, Sergeant? She asked if she could leave an envelope for Patrolman Dillon. I said, yeah, sure. She wanted to know if he'd be sure to get it. I told her he was working on that too, and I'd leave it in the mail rack. But everybody checks the mail rack when they come in off the job. Do you have anything else to say? Well, nothing important. The lieutenant was booking a narcotics uh, prisoner, and I could see she was a little bit fascinated about that. She was trying to make small talk to stick around a few minutes longer. What kind of small talk? Well, she would tell me about a trip. She just got back from Nashville. She spent about six weeks down there. That she went before Christmas. Is that so? Yes, sir. Told me she traveled all over the world by herself at one time or another. The only continent she hadn't been to was Australia. A pretty interesting whole dame. Did uh, she tell you exactly when she got back? Monday, I think she said. Uh, yes, sir, Monday. There's nothing you can recall Monday or Tuesday, is there, Dylan? No, sir, I was off Monday and Tuesday. Well, what about yesterday? Not a thing yesterday, Captain. Well, it must have been before she went away. Yes, sir. The woman left a gratuity of $100 for Dylan, Sergeant. Did she? You have any idea who it was, sir? No, sir. Must have been before Christmas. You uh, still have the pages in your memorandum book that go back that far? Yes, sir. They're down in my locker. Well, uh, without referring to your memorandum book, do you have any recollection of any occurrence involving a woman such as Sergeant Waters described? Any recollection of anything that occurred before Christmas sometime? No, sir. Not, not offhand. Were you assigned to your present post then? No, sir. I was on number seven. I was on number seven for about two months before the first of the year. I... Wait a minute. Yes? There was something that happened right around the middle of December that might have a connection. What's that? Well, I don't know whether this is it or not. What? Well, I was on post there and I saw a woman flag a taxi. A woman such as Sergeant Waters described? Yes, sir. The cab pulled into this bus stop. The driver opened the door and she started to get in. And just as she was getting in... A car's Tom Buck came up and bumped the cab in the back. Not hard. It was stopping, and there was an ice patch in the street. I guess the driver misjudged his distance a little. Anyway, it knocked the cab forward a little bit and threw her into the gutter. Uh-huh. Well, I went across, and I picked her up. She wasn't hurt bad. Skinned the palm of her hands, I think, and one knee. She wore a pair of stockings and a pair of gloves. Yeah, I know. Well, there wasn't any damage to the bus and none to the cab either. I got the name of the bus driver and let him go. I sat the lady in the back of the cab and asked her if she wanted to go to the hospital. She said she wasn't hurt, but I tried to talk her into going to the hospital. You think this might have been the woman? Well, Captain, it's the only instance I remember, but to tell you the truth, I don't see why she'd be grateful $100 for it. She was the victim of an accident, and I was there. I just did what I could. Did you make out an aided card? Yes, sir, but she refused medical aid. About uh, December 15th, you say? 
Yes, sir, about the middle of December, Captain, before Christmas. Sergeant, will you see if you can find that UF-6 in the file? Okay, Captain. Uh, was it our 66th or 65th, Dylan? 66th, Sergeant. First was eastbound, if I remember. 66th in Madison, I think. Okay. I got the pages from my memorandum book down in my locker, Captain. You know, well, her name and address should be on the, on the 6th. Yes, sir, they are. I don't see why she should be the one, though, Captain. I didn't do anything for her. Well, sometimes a kind word can go a long way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 21st, please, Captain Canale. Sergeant Rosen, I'm T.S., Captain. Lieutenant King is ringing down for you. Okay. Hello, Matt. Yes, Captain. Listen, Matt, I came in this morning, and the desk officer told me we had a call about two suspicious men in an automobile parked on 89th Street in Lexington this morning about 2.30. Yes, sir. He sent a car over there to take a look, and it turned out to be two detectives from the safe and loft squad on a plant. Now, we're supposed to get notification when there's a plant in this precinct. This is the first I've heard of it, Captain. When we get a call about two suspicious men in an automobile at 2.30 in the morning, we've got to send over there and look into it. Supposing whoever they were watching there saw these uniformed officers stop. Well, that might spoil a collar for the detectives. I didn't even know they were in the precinct, Captain. I'll check into it and see why the desk officer wasn't notified. All right, you go ahead and check into it, Matt. I'm going to send a 49 downtown anyway. Okay, Captain. I'll let you know what they say. I'd be interested. See you, Matt. Yes, sir. Uh, did you, uh, tell your wife about the envelope, Dylan? Yes, sir. What'd she have to say? Well, come in. Oh, uh, come in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I found it, Captain. December the 16th. That's about right. What's the woman's name? Edna Coleskill, 67 years old. 783, 873. Oh, yeah, yeah. When are you on T.S. today, Sergeant? The early part of the tour. All right. As soon as you go out on patrol, take a ride over and see Mrs. Coleskill. You know if it's the same woman who left the envelope? Yes, sir. All right. You're excused, Dylan. Better change in the uniform. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. You're welcome. Tell her I'm much obliged, Sergeant. I will. If it's the same woman. Here you are, Sergeant. If it's her, get a receipt. Yes, sir. Oh, I know that house. That's a private residence. One of those old mansions, I, I think this lady's going to turn out to be a rich dowager. Yeah. Well, you make her a hundred dollars richer. You're listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Sergeant Waters finished his telephone switchboard duty at noon and was relieved by Sergeant Kenny. After his meal, he went on patrol of the precinct, supervising the men on the job. Pursuant to my instructions, he had his operator, Patrolman Jacoby, drive to 783 East 70th Street, a four-story white limestone mansion built in the early part of the century. When the car pulled in front of the house, he told Jacoby to wait. Sergeant Waters got out, crossed the sidewalk, mounted the marble steps, and walked to the huge iron grill door. He rang the bell, waited a moment, then rang a second time. Through the glass, he saw a butler approach. Good afternoon. Is this the residence of Edna Colfield? Uh, yes, it is. Is she home? I'd like to talk to her. Is there some trouble? No, I'd just like to see her. Would you come in, please? Yeah. Does she expect you, Sergeant? No. Uh, you are Sergeant... Waters, uh, Sergeant Waters. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Colfield is in the upstairs sitting room. Oh. This way, please. Quite a place. Yes, it is. Reminds me of City Hall. Uh, uh, upstairs, please. One becomes accustomed to it. I am at. Mrs. Colesfield came here as a bride in 1907. Uh, you, uh, you don't have any alarming news, do you? No, nothing like that. This way, please. Thanks. Would you wait right here a moment, please? I shall not you. Oh, yeah. Uh, it'll just be a moment. <clears throat> Sergeant Waters of the police department, madam. Uh, yes, madam. All right. <clears throat> uh, 
Mrs. Corsfield will see you, Sergeant. Uh, this way, please. This would be some place to throw a party. <laughs> uh, there would be some uh, throne here. Uh, Sergeant Waters. Come in, come in, please. And uh, would you please tell Myra that the menu for dinner is fine? Yes, madam. Yes, Sergeant? Hello, Mrs. Coleskill. Oh, you and I had that nice talk yesterday. That's right. At the police station. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm so glad you came, won't you, sit down? Thank you. Well, I didn't tell you my name. How did you find out who I was? Uh, Mrs. Coleskill, I came to give you back your hundred dollars. Doesn't that boy want it? Well, it's not a question of whether he wants it or not. He's not allowed to take it. Oh, now that's ridiculous. It's my money. If I want to give him a hundred dollars, I just give it to him. It's contrary to the regulation. But it's still my hundred dollars. I know. If but... I want to give someone a hundred dollars, that's between me and the person I give it to, don't you think? That's what I think, Mrs. Colson. Well, you come here and tell me the boy isn't allowed to accept a hundred dollars. It must be what you think. I was sent here to give it back to you. By whom? By the captain. Well, then why didn't the captain come here himself? Why did he have someone else to do his dirty work? It's not the captain's fault. Oh, now, in a minute, you're going to be up to President Eisenhower. And I know he had nothing to do with it. No, ma'am. Now, I want you to go back and tell that captain something. I want you to tell him that I was perfectly delighted with the young policeman. He couldn't have been more solicitous. He was concerned about me. He wanted to help me. He wanted to get an ambulance. He was just determined to see that I was taken care of. It's all part of his job. If I want to show my gratitude, that's up to me. Uh, Mrs. Colby. I'm an old woman. I have no family anymore. I live in this big house all alone. I'm just fortunate to have a considerable amount of money. Now, he didn't know that. He had no way of knowing it. I just wanted to show him how I felt. We do the same thing for everyone. Well, that's good. I congratulate you. Now, tell the captain to let the boy keep the $100 and let's forget the whole thing. I'm sorry, Mrs. Colby. Well, you certainly don't seem sorry. That's not what I mean exactly. I I mean I'll have to return the money. Supposing I don't want to take it. I was long enough getting it to him, heaven knows. The very next day after that accident, I went to my house in Nassau. I've been thinking about that young man ever since. Now, I just got back Monday, and one of the first things I did was to go over and leave that envelope. I wanted to do it. I just had to show my gratitude. Now, you're not going to deny an old lady a small pleasure. I'm not denying you anything, ma'am. Well, you certainly are. Don't give me any more of those excuses about that captain and President Eisenhower, because I won't believe a word of it. What's his name, anyway? Kennelly. Captain Frank Kennelly. Well, who does she think he is? Look, Mrs. Coleskill, I want you to take this money and sign a receipt for it. Well, I can see I won't get anywhere with you. There's a pen on that desk, chair, if you'd be good enough to get it. I got a pen. Oh, thank you. Is that captain there now? Yes, ma'am. He'll be there until 6 o'clock. Mm, there you are. Uh, uh, captain Kelly, huh? Kennelly. Well, there's 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. Kennelly. Well, you tell him to expect me. I'm going over there this afternoon and find out what this is all about. Captain, indeed. He can't tell me what to do. No, but he sure can tell me, and he did. Sergeant Waters left the mansion on East 70th Street and resumed patrol of the precinct. At 3.15, the men who would be working the night tour began to stream into the station house. They walked in the front door, through the back room, and down to the lockers to change the uniform. After they dressed, they came upstairs to the back room where they copied posted alarms for wanted persons and automobiles into their memorandum books, and were inspected by the patrol sergeant of the oncoming tour. Promptly at 4 p.m., the desk officer hit the bell and the men marched out into the muster room for the turnout. After the roll call, I gave them special instructions and on command of the sergeant, they marched out the front door to take over their posts, relieving the men who had been working the 8 to 4. Following the turnout, I remained behind the desk for a few minutes talking to Lieutenant Snyder, the oncoming desk officer. Then, as I crossed the muster room toward my office, I saw Sergeant Waters come in the front door. Sergeant? Yes, sir. Did you get to see that Mrs. Cole's kill, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I did. Had an awful time getting her to take the money back. She took it, didn't she? Finally? Yes. All right. Face the receipt in the property book. Okay, Captain. Oh, uh, she didn't come in to see you, did she? 
Now, did she say she was going to? That's what she told me. She hasn't been here yet. Well, you've got something to look forward to, Captain. Uh-huh. Captain Ellie. Yes? Lieutenant King is bringing down for you from upstairs. All right, I'll take it in my office. All right, Sergeant, I'll see you. Okay, Captain. First precinct, Captain Canelli. Lieutenant King, Captain. Yes, Matt. I checked downtown on those two detectives who were on a plant here last night. Yeah? They didn't know they were going to plant that building. They had a suspect under surveillance, and he went in there. Oh. I was waiting for him to come out. It wasn't time to let the desk officer know they were on a plant. Oh. Okay, Matt. I Matt. thought it might have been something like that, Captain. The safe and lost squad's pretty clear about letting us know what they're doing. They don't want to take a chance on spoiling a collar any more than you don't want to spoil it for them. Yeah, all right, Matt. Yes, sir. First precinct, Captain Canelli. Sergeant Roseman, P.S. Captain. Yes. There's a Mrs. Cole skill out here to see you, Captain. All right, ask her to come in. Yes, sir. Oh, and uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I want to see Patrolman Dillon when he gets in our post. Okay, Captain. Are you Captain Canelli? That's right, Miss Cole skill. Would you uh, come in, please? Sir. I must say you don't look like such a monster. Don't I? Would you like to sit down? Thank you. Yes, Miss Coleskill. I understand that you're the one who deprived that young man of what I gave him. I didn't deprive him of anything, Mrs. Coleskill. What do you call it, then? It's contrary to the rules for a member of the force to accept a gratuity for the performance of his duty. It was more than a performance of his duty. He went out of his way to be extraordinarily considerate of me. He wanted to help me and get an ambulance and a doctor and make sure I was all right. That's exactly what he was supposed to do. And you won't let him take the money? I can't let him take the money. If he did, I'd be required to prefer charges against him. I see no, I don't think you do, Mrs. Colskill. Well, I'll tell you, Captain. I decided that I would do something for that young man, and I'm going to. He can't accept anything from you. You may not know it, but I have a reputation for being slightly eccentric. If I weren't so wealthy and so old, people might say I'm unbalanced. But with age and money, they're kind enough to call it eccentricity. Now, because of your silly rule, you've made me all the more determined. I can assure you, Mrs. Colskill, you are no more determined than I am. Well, you don't know how determined I can get. You see, after that sergeant came this afternoon and practically forced me into taking the hundred dollars back, I just came got my eccentricity out. Did you? I decided there must be a way, and I was determined to find out what it was. There's no way to give him money. Oh, isn't there? No. I can certainly leave it to him. I checked with my attorney. I had him on the telephone for an hour this afternoon. I can name the boy in my will, and there's not a thing you can do about it. You know the whole police department or anyone. Is there? Well, I suppose we can't tell you how to dispose of your estate. And I want to tell you that the amount will be many times the puny hundred dollars you wouldn't let him take. Many times the amount. My attorney is already preparing a codicil. I'm going to sign it tomorrow, so you needn't try to talk me out of doing it. I can't try to talk you out of it, Mrs. Colesville. Well, that's all I have on my mind. I hope you're satisfied. I'm sure that young man patrolman Dillon will be. As I said, Mrs. Colesville, we can't tell you how to draw your will. I know very well you can. I know that very well. You wanted to see me, Captain? Yes, Dylan. Oh, hello there, young man. Mrs. Colesville, I... I certainly appreciate what you tried to do, but I had to turn the money back against the rules. So I understand. I've just been talking to him. But don't you worry. You're a very nice young man, and I'm sure you'll do very well for yourself in life. Don't you think so, Captain? Yes, I think so. Goodbye, Captain. And goodbye, young man. Goodbye, Miss Colesville. It was a pleasure knowing you. Yes, Captain. Come inside. Yes, sir. Hello, Dylan. You spent eight hours on post today, isn't that right? Yes, sir. And for eight hours, you've been thinking maybe you were a fool for turning in that hundred dollars because no one would ever have known about it except you and her. 
No, Captain, I wasn't thinking that. Not exactly. All right. Take my word for it. You did exactly what you should have done. Yes, sir. It might take a little while for you to get absolute proof of the fact. But you'll get it. I guarantee you will. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. I'm robbing the 24th. Well, we don't know much more about it here. We got the car. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, transcribed. The factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, city of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Ethel Everett, Bill Quinn, and Ivor Francis. Written and directed by Stanley Miss. Stuart Nett speaking.